All right. Welcome on YouTube, out there on the interwebs. We're thrilled to have you back. Um, if all the signals still work good, especially Facebook, uh, Pastor Kim will play Vanna White for us and check in on you. So share any comments or questions that you have. And we're back into the book of Acts, chapter 8. Um, some great stuff, just a little commercial for upcoming Mission of the Month. Yesterday I had lunch with Mike Platt. Mm. And Mike and Laurie Platt serve um, on the mission field reaching Turkish people. They pastored in Istanbul for decades and are now in North Cyprus. And he said that his favorite Bible character is Philip. And he gave me more information in five minutes at lunch than I could share tonight. Um, and I might wait to share it until Philip shows up again in, you know, about 10, 10 or 12 chapters. But, um, so I think we're on the right, on the right track when I'm having lunch with somebody from North Cyprus and Laurel Pizzeria and say, hey, we're studying Acts 8. And he's like, that's one of my favorite chapters. Philip's one of my favorite characters. So it seemed like confirmation. But Alan is leading the discussion tonight, and I will let him take it away. Okay. Well, I also like chapter 8 because this, for me, this is one of the first, uh, how should I say, this is where the church begins to get an inkling of one of God's primary plans, which was to spread the gospel beyond just the Jews. Yes. So, um, so it was good. Uh, our reader, Sam, I had to go to the restroom, so I guess I will be uh, I will be playing the part of Sam today for the first, <laughs> for the first reading. So uh, we're going to go ahead. Uh, so chapter chapter eight, we're going to go verse one through eight. Uh, so I'm going to jump in here. So Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria. And he told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and to see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Mm -hmm. See, I told you our reader was here. Um, I was playing the part of Sam from the beginning. I didn't get the... Yeah. Okay. It was maybe... A B minus or C on the drama. Yeah, not a lot of drama in it. So we're, we're, we're kind of, this is a weird, kind of a weird chapter break because we're kind of picking up at the end of, of seven. If you guys remember, that was where uh, Stephen was stoned. Um, and uh, I believe technically it was his first martyr yeah. uh, for the church. So Saul was there, and if we, we everybody, uh, it is a good Bible study. Saul is, turns into to Paul later on. Uh, however, at this point in time, he is very uh, zealous about persecuting the church. Uh, in, in one one version, I just lost it too. Saul mercilessly persecuted the church, going from house to house into the homes of believers to arrest both men and women and drag them off to prison. So, like, he, he's, he's like, you can't even be safe in your house. He was knocking down doors, going in, uh, really going at it. And so this, is, so this is, let me back up a little bit. So like I was saying before, I like this chapter because it begins to reveal, I believe, one of God's primary plans in, in, in everything that he had done so far up to this point uh, in creation. That was that he didn't want anyone to perish, not just the Jews but the Gentiles too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you recall, there was a, uh, a lot of racial tension back then, just like there is today, okay, a lot of prejudice. Um, and uh, was it two chapters back we were talking about how they were complaining because the Gentile widows that had converted to Jews were not getting fed 
yeah, in the food distribution. Six. Okay, and so guess what? Who were the they, they appointed these the deacons to do that stuff? Yeah. Well, we just ran into two of the names of the deacons. Stephen was one of the deacons, and Philip here was one of those people that was appointed yep. to take care of and make sure that everybody was getting an even distribution, that there wasn't any uh, prejudice going on. Yeah. And so uh, I know Tom and I talked about this concept, uh, I think, last week, uh, which is, will, will God let bad things happen to you? Mm -hmm. And if you think about the way the mentality was back there, that the Jews were God's chosen people, so the Messiah came for them, and now you're now they're starting to realize that it wasn't a military revolution that they were doing, right. but they I think they still had that mindset that that Jesus was for the Jews, not for everybody. Right. And so, it, it, the, the, I, I know this works with me. Sometimes God God tells me something, and I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> and God tells me it again. I'm like, is that God? I don't know. And then He gets a two by four out. <laughs> and he whacks me with it until I get on on, on the right path. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel like that's kind of what's happening here. Yeah. Is I feel like God said, all right, I, you guys aren't getting out of Jerusalem. You're not doing what I said to do. You know, if you recall, he said, go to all the nations. Not just go to the Jews. Yeah. Go to all the nations. <laughs> okay. And so I think God's allowing the two by four to come out. Because it says the believers who were scattered... The church was scattered because of this persecution. And we read just about Saul, but he was not the only one going about. Okay, There was a, there was a large group uh, of, the, um, of the religious leaders at that time that were putting together posses, if you would, <laughs> to go and hunt down these believers and, and, and get them out. And so the believer, believers were scattered. And so here we see that Philip is one of these believers. He gets scattered, and he goes to Samaria, which is... If you, if you really think about it, it's kind of a great bridge between the Jews and the Gentiles because who were the Sumerians? They were a mixed people. They were a mix of the Gentiles and the Jews. Yeah. It was their heritage. That was what their, their racial heritage was. So that's kind of like, that's like a perfect bridge to go to, go to the Gentiles. It's not, they're getting good to Sumeria. So the Samaritans. So, Samaritans, yeah. Right. Not, I'm sorry. Not I, Sumer. Yeah, no. Okay. I was, just, I was concerned. I wondered if I was hearing it wrong or what was going on. I'm I'm Samaritans. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Samaritans are different than Sumerians. Yes. Yes, yes I, I was. If I said Sumerian, I was wrong. I'm not I trying to say that. I don't know if I heard it wrong. I just thought I'd clarify. Samaritans who live in Samaria. Yeah. Like not the Samaritans first people. No. Yeah. Like Samaritans first. Right. Yeah. So that's where that is exactly from. where Samaritans right. first come from. But anyway, I just was yeah. clarifying Sumer was a different yeah. time period and a different place. So I, I didn't know if I heard it wrong or not. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, I um, flipped back to chapter 1, and I had this thought. I don't think I actually looked at it till now. Um, when Jesus commissions them in Acts chapter 1, he says, you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. The way I read this is they didn't do it. Yeah. It right. took them eight chapters. Yes. And then finally, after eight chapters, now they're being sent out into Judea, Samaria, and to the other parts of the world. And so sometimes, yeah, God will do stuff that is uncomfortable. Hello, Patty, okay. just throw my jacket on the, on the uh, other chair. Just throw it on. Just throw it. Yeah, just throw it everywhere. <laughs> throw it somewhere. Kim you? said she would tell you where to put her jacket, but I thought that was bad phrasing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Internet. Your husband is on here. Yeah, by Mr. Doctor Pat. Mr. Doctor Pat. Now, now, Mrs. Mr. Doctor Pat is here, by the way. So she's, she's joining us in a very lovely. Um, Lots of print. Animal print. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How cool is that? I have an animal print girl in my life too. So stylish. So yeah, they they went out, and when we were talking about it. Um, we often quote Harold Everly and credit and or blame him for stuff. And, um, and when Harold is asked why do bad things happen to people, he starts with God. He, he cuts right to the chase and he says, sometimes God does things that we consider bad. And he's like, 
don't, don't make any mistake about it, God can do whatever he wants. And um, so I, I think there's some measure of God allowing the persecution to motivate them to do what they've done. And Harold actually told a story um, of a youth leader in a militantly Muslim country who literally got chopped to pieces in front of his youth group. Wow. Um, not, not a good thing by any means at all. And the kid would not renounce Christ, even as they literally cut him to pieces. And not only did it put a fire in the believers who had followed this guy, um, but his persecutors all came to faith. Wow. And, and basically, because they were the thugs in the community, they had a position where they could now protect believers while claiming that they were not. And, and did that kind of protective thing. And so basically what Harold says with that is not, no, God didn't enforce this, but God had a redemptive element. Absolutely. In it. And um, I think the same thing is true here that, you know, I, I don't think God, we get too philosophical with it, but God doesn't do bad things to us, um, to his kids, but he'll redeem things that happen. His plans for us are for good. Scripture's really clear. So can God use something and turn it around and, and be redemptive of it? Absolutely. And, you know, let's be honest. Where Stephen got to is where we all want to go. You know, what a fantastic witness. And, and I've heard people talk about, did he feel any pain? You know, was he gone before the rocks actually hit his body? You know, that kind of thing. So, but... You know, they're getting out and again. I, I've had lunch with a missionary from the other side of the world who said, this guy is my, you know, one of my favorites mm -hmm. for being able to do that. So God will use things. <laughs> Didn't the preacher say on Sunday in, in, in the, new, the new normal? Um, we're going to have to learn some things. We may have to give some things up. Yes. And we may face new challenges. Mm -hmm. So I think the church in the book of Acts is getting a new normal. Yeah, yeah they're definitely Absolutely. getting a new normal. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else for anybody? For these few verses? Two things before we proceed. Patty opened in her Bible. Remind me, if you don't know already, Dr. Jack Hayford, who was the author of this book, slipped into eternity. In the well, we weren't looking. Days. Yeah. Well, I hadn't heard much from him in quite a while. Um, in the article that was on CBN News, didn't really give a lot of detail, but I, I have the impression that he was pretty much homebound for quite a while. Um, he had lost his wife of 60 years, I think in 2017, but he had remarried, and, and the impression I got from an earlier article was that he remarried to some measure um, to have a caretaker. That, that the woman he married was taking care of him in his older age. And the article said that he ate dinner with his family, that he talked with one of his grandkids, he went to bed for the night, and he was gone in the morning. How awesome is that? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it actually sounded like Christine's father-in-law. Christine Wooten, um, who's our greeter every other month, her father-in-law is 92, passed away recently. Same kind of thing, had dinner with the family, chatted a little bit, went to bed. When they went in the morning, he was gone. Anyway, Pastor Jack Hayford is, is with Jesus in heaven. And verse 8, I love in the passion, um, Philip's ministry resulted in an uncontainable joy filling the city. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's the other thing. As the church scattered, so scattered the healing and the yes. joy and the message of Jesus. Miracles. Yeah. Because yeah. we carry Mi that stuff. Miracles and deliverance and healing. A lot of good stuff. Anything else? Let's move on to Simon. So we're going to read the next is a big chunk. We're going to go 9 to 25. Save the big one for you, 20. Sam. One. <laughs> I'm just waiting for you to start. We're, sure. we're waiting with anticipation, Sam. It's been six weeks. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years. Amazing 
the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because of because for a long time he had outstanded them with his magic. Astounded. Astounded. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went. And he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip's, Philip performed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he explained, so that when I lay my hands on people, they would receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, May your money be destroyed with you, for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and held captive by sin. Pray to... What? Keep going. I was going to. Okay. You interrupted me. <laughs> Pray to the Lord for me, Simon explained, that these terrible things you said won't happen to me. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, and they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. Oh, right. Good stuff. <laughs> Much better dramatic level than your dad's reading. I, you know, I, <laughs> I can't really reach that line. I tried before the lunch. <laughs> Everybody's got their own gift. All right, so here we have a get introduced to Simon the sorcerer. So there's this dude, so Simon is doing sorcery uh, in Samaria to the point that everybody knows about him, which means that something must have been going on there. So you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like he was just some you know, street charlatan. There was, there was, I believe he was tapping into some power there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the problem was people, it says people were talking about him like the great one and like the power of God, uh, which I, I feel like I wouldn't want to stand near him <laughs> for fear of lightning strike accidentally hitting me. Um, yeah. But he's definitely listening. He's definitely um, tapping into some spiritual energy there. Uh, in the, now, the good news, I think, is that he converts to Christianity. He hears, hears uh, <laughs> what uh, Philip is preaching, and uh, he sees the miracles that, that Philip's doing, and, and he converts. And then he's following some, uh, Philip around watched him do all these miracles. Um, now, we get a glimpse later on because uh, Peter reveals what's in his heart, which is the jealousy of, so now what's happening is, you've got somebody, a local guy, who had the spotlight of spiritual power, okay, in this town. And you got this guy who's coming in from Jerusalem, nobody knows him, and suddenly he's stolen the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would guess part of the reason I mean, well, obviously the main reason is he's, you know, he's actually got God's uh, authority and, and uh, glory is coming through, okay? And he's healing people. So, I, you know, it doesn't say what Simon was doing, but I don't believe that he was healing people. Right. Okay. I, I, I believe he was doing some stuff that was supernatural, but I don't believe that it was anything that was very beneficial to the individuals in the town. Or the town as a whole, it was only beneficial to him. Mm -hmm. right. I can shed some light on that. Can I? Can I interject something? Oh yeah, that, yeah. Simon. So the word for sorcery in the Greek is pharmakia. So there's a connection between drugs and drug abuse and sorcery. So he was the, probably like the local witch doctor, and he was probably um, with deception and, and um, fraud, fraudulent 
practices was you know, healing people, but it was all deception, it was all sleight of hand, and it was probably with the help of maybe some um, form of su substance abuse going on. You know, there was maybe some other su illicit substances he was, you know, giving out and making people feel some type of way with all the stuff he was doing, who knows? But um, sorcery and drug abuse goes together. That's where we get um, the connection between witchcraft and, and drug addiction and drug abuse. So. Yeah, that's, that's very much possible. Um, I do know that he was most likely doing it for himself. So all yes. of that, and so that fits in that too, because yes. most of the wish doctors and stuff. And he's a local drug dealer. You know, most of the wish doctors, <laughs> yeah. here's this potion that's gonna help you. Right. right. You gotta come back in a month to get another dose though. There right? you go. Or it's gonna stop working. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, if, oh, you're gonna offend me? You're not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna help you when you get this. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of gates that those types of people will put in place in order to elevate themselves, mostly by pushing other people down. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what he's doing. So he can verse it out. I don't, I have studied this and I prayed and I don't, I don't know if he was a true convert or if he just said he was. If I don't, like, you know, I don't, the, 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 I don't know if he was a couch Christian or right. if he was an actual, right. you know, born again Christian. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this could be the first instance of somebody who just is professing that they're a Christian, right, with no actual faith or, or, or connection to back it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but we know that he had jealousy in his heart because right. he was following Philip around. And I think what he was doing was he was trying to become. Philip's entourage, because when you have a famous person and they have an entourage, the entourage gets to enjoy a lot of things that normal people don't get to enjoy just by being with the famous person. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. They get Trying to get to into the restaurants. Themselves. They get to, you know, they yeah. get to bask in that themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like he was attaching himself to Philip in order to try and get a hold of some of that to, <laughs> to, to be. I, I'm I'm his right hand man. You can't. And he may have even. This is not said, so take it with a grain of salt, but he may have even tried to set himself up as a gatekeeper to get into film, mm -hmm. okay? Because the people who set themselves up as their gatekeepers and the entourage and the famous people feel themselves have, have a lot of power then, right? Because yeah. I get to control who gets to see this, this person or not. Yeah. And you're gonna, you're gonna pay me or give me favors in order to phone, I'll get you in, mm -hmm. you know? And Phil's walking around healing people, you know? He's following the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, casting out demons, healing people, and so he's, he's locking on there. And then, word gets back to Jerusalem. Now here's another thing that I thought was very interesting that is kind of an undercurrent again to, to chapter 8 here where God starts to scatter the church. All the believers in the church were scattered, but guess who stood tall in Jerusalem? The apostles. <laughs> we're not running. We, we've already hid in the upper room enough. We're yeah. done. Yeah. They stayed in Jerusalem, and they faced the persecution head on. I'm not saying that they're any better than the other guys, because the, the other guys were taking care of God's business too. Mm -hmm. Again, everybody in the body of Christ has their own, you know, function that they need to, to mm -hmm. perform. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was interesting to think, you know what? The apostles never scattered from Jerusalem. They 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 weathered that storm of persecution, and just they stayed they stayed their course. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, so he gets back to Jerusalem, and you know they're like, "Oh, oh!" So the Samaritans are, are, are getting, oh, wow. So maybe we should go up there and, and see what's going on, you know. So uh, uh, Peter and uh, John, oh, Peter and John. Uh, crap. Peter and John. John, yeah. Peter and John go down to Samaria. Uh, to check it out, see what's going on. They meet up with Pete, with Philip, and they, they go, okay, these guys are for real. This is this is really happening. Uh, and I think that might have, <laughs> I wish I, uh, you, you, you know, you, when we get to heaven, we can see some of the home movies. I, I, I want to see the look on their faces when they begin to realize, well, wait a minute, maybe this isn't all just for the Jews here. Like, you know, they start to get that recognition that all oh, this stuff going on. Well let's, well, let's go ahead and get them all in. If they're going to be in, they need to be all in. So let's get them baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so they start going and doing that. And so then Simon sees this and see. Let's back up a little bit. The witch doctors, the sorcerers of the time, 
Um, these people did not hand out their power. Right. They hoarded it, mm -hmm. and they didn't pass it on to other people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because they were operating in the world's economy. They weren't operating in God's economy. Do you understand what I'm talking about when I say that? They had one pie, and they cut the pieces up, and they had to get as many pieces as they could because there was a finite number of pieces in that pie. Right? Yeah. That's the world's economy. God's economy says, I'm going to cut the pie up, and everybody take what you need because if we run out, I'm going to make another pie. Right. Okay. That's God's economy. So they're working under the world's economy. They don't, they don't give out their power. I believe that's why he never actually asked Philip about, you know, this didn't come up until, you know, Peter and John showed up on the scene. Because he didn't, he didn't, it didn't never occurred to him that Philip would give up some of that power to somebody else, right? So then he sees Peter and John laying on hands and people are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you got to remember, this is the chapter of Acts, okay? This is when it was first happening, and we've got a lot of physical signs when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Talking about tongues of fire, speaking in tongues. You know, things were happening. It was just not just like, oh, look, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. There was stuff going on, right? Right. It was visible. It was visible. There was a change, an immediate and drastic change that came over. Yeah. All right. So Simon sees this, and he's like, holy crap. And so, again, he's operating in the world economy still. And he says, let me, I need to get some of that. Because then I can get back to some of my notoriety that I had before all this stuff happened. And I'll just do it in the new, in the new thing. So, again, that's, why, that's one of the things why I think I don't, I don't really believe that Simon converted true at that point. And maybe he did after what you know, Peter said to him. But before that, I think there was still that one foot in, one foot. I think he was just like, this is the new thing, and I'm going to get in on this. You know, I don't think there was a true connection there. Uh, and I, I can't remember how it's pronounced. Is, isn't it like, even to this day, Simon, 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 Simon Lolly? Yeah, there's um, something here, or maybe it was in, in the Passion, that his name became synonymous with heresy. Yeah, with with, uh, with the actually with the purchasing of right. uh, spiritual gift, spiritual benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so like when you're you're talking about buying um, indulgences, indulgences and stuff that falls under that category. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of that thing. Uh, so anyway, so he start, he starts to do that, and so this is the cool thing is that you know, God looks at your heart. He's not gonna. He, he doesn't look at your outside, which is which is a double-edged sword. If you're like Simon and you're just pretending. That's yeah. it. You can't you can't pretend with God, mm -hmm. uh, but here's the thing: the peer peer rebukes him, and in rebuking him, he says his heart is is got jealousy in it. And so there's there's really I think there's two things that are happening here that are stopping that are barring Simon from participating in the Holy Spirit. Okay, the first and the foremost, the most important is his heart wasn't right. Mm -hmm. He wanted. The Holy Spirit's power, not the Holy Spirit. There's a very big difference there. Okay? Yeah. Very big difference there. He wanted the Holy Spirit's power so that he could elevate him, bring glory to himself again. Right? He didn't want the Holy Spirit, per se. So his heart was wrong. The other side of that coin is I believe that his character was not. His character was not, he didn't have character. So let me back up a little bit. So if you've ever done like the giving thought, have you ever done something where the Holy Spirit comes on you and, it, and you can feel a weight settle on you? And there's been times when I've been preaching or I've been doing something and I'm, I'm like holding on for dear life, I'm trying to stand up, okay? Um, and I've spoken in front of people a lot, so it's not a fear of crowds. That What that is, is that's the Holy Spirit. That is part of God's glory getting put down on top of Okay. Now God's glory can manifest in many ways. It can manifest in healing, it can manifest in demons being well. But God's God's glory has weight. And it's not a physical weight like that. It's a spiritual weight. And part of the scaffolding that has to hold up that weight is your character. Mm -hmm. And if your character is not strong, if your character is not the right built the right way, 
it will collapse under that weight of glory. Yeah. And so God being a good father is not going to put too much on you. So now we can learn a lesson from Simon if you're walking around and you're going, how come I'm not seeing as many miracles or I'm not praying for people and seeing them get healed and stuff. One of the things that we can look at is we can look at our character. We can look and see, are we growing our character? Is our character strong enough? Is our character strong enough to allow God to place enough glory of his glory on us so we can manifest those miracles without hurting ourselves? Because he's not going to hurt you. So you may be saying, I want to see these more miracles, but he's, he might be trying to tell you you're not you're not ready for it yet. You're not mm -hmm. strong enough spiritually. It's, it's, it's going to hurt you if I put too much of my glory on you. Mm -hmm. So in Simon's case, there's those two things. Again, the foundational thing, the foremost problem is his heart wasn't right. Mm -hmm. That, that canceled everything else out. But I believe also his character was not there. Mm -hmm. And if God had decided to put some glory on him, the, the weight of it would have crushed him. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor Kevin, I'm wondering your thoughts on Simon. Well, uh, about whether he is um, really converted or not. Is that what you mean? Yeah, where do you think he was at? I think he had, you know, worldly sorrow at this moment. You know, where he's, oh no, I'm caught. You know, <laughs> um, I, he strikes me as the kind of person that is, uh, you know, like I said, he's he's big pharma of the day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. He's the Dr. Fauci of the day. Oh, please. So, um, you know, so he, he's, um, I mean, we know in other scripture it says that selfish ambition is a, is an open door to every evil thing. Yeah. So this guy's heart is full of that stuff. You know, he's yeah. got demons in his life because he's opened himself up to sorcery, demonic activity, witchcraft. I know the phrase just popped into my head about, about this, and was your, your talk about that, uh, so I don't mean to interrupt you, but that um, uh, fire fire insurance kind of Christianity. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that just in sorry. case, you know, I want to cover all my bases kind of thing. Exactly. That's, that's kind of what feels like fits with where he was at. Was, Worldly sorry. You know, things are changing, and this is some new stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. well, we'll go with that, too. Again, remembering that's part of the culture around Israel were multi gods, you know. It was okay to have multiple gods. So Simon might have been, you know, in with a couple of gods, and then said, "Oh yeah, we'll just add this Jesus guy too." You know, it's cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, there's a difference between true repentance and worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is, oh no, I've got caught. I better say the right things. I better, you know, I. There's a lot of people that come into substance abuse treatment and they play Which the is, god card. Yeah. You know, they. You know what I mean? They try to say they're a Christian or and tell me. Or in prison, yeah. Same thing. So they try to say, you know, I'm a good guy. You know, I'm, I'm not. I wouldn't have done that. I'm Christian or whatever. You know, and really, it's worldly sorrow. It's trying to use the gospel for it to make yourself look better and well, more righteous. Or and something. that's even that is all centered around selfishness because yes. worldly sorrow is, oh, well, now I'm going to be in trouble because right. I got caught. Yeah. Not that I'm sorry I did the thing, but I'm sorry I got caught and I don't want to suffer the penalties. And so. Right. Right. <clears throat> so. I mean, can someone like that get saved? Of course, but I don't know whether this guy's really sincere or not. Doesn't seem like it. Ladies, what do you think? Was he sincere? Was he playing? I think he became sincere once it was pointed out to him. But he was walking this walk, and he didn't know there was two sides to that same coin. He was just doing his shtick, and it's the shtick, and I'll add it in, you know. And I was like, oh no, there's more to this. This has to come from the heart and it, for real commitment. And then he was willing to make that once mm -hmm. he knew that's what was required. Mm -hmm. But he was t totally oblivious until he got called out on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like he still needs... <clears throat> needs some cleaning up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't feel that he really gets... I mean, he gets it, but I don't think he totally gets it. Mm. So here's here's... My latest perspective on this, I'm sure I've read it different ways before. And I'm, I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum. And, and we don't really know. No. It doesn't really yeah, attribute exactly. motive to him. But here's, here's my, in defense of Simon. <laughs> Verse 13 says, Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. Um, Passion says, Even Simon believed and was baptized with an exclamation point. When his wrong is pointed out to him, 
He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't argue with Peter. He says, pray to the Lord for me that these terrible things you've said won't happen. And so I see in Simon, again, you know, with our, our ministry that we've done through the years to folks with substance abuse, folks with mixed stuff, um, I've been reading some stuff recently that is people who are, are portraying themselves as Christians or were Christians or had some kind of Christian label. And then there's just some other stuff there. Right. And it's a little bit of a mix spiritually. They need some inner healing and deliverance. Yeah, they need some real sozo. deep cleaning yeah. on the inside. Some kind of sozo ministry, which the new couple, by the way, that came Sunday, that was their question. What? Can you explain what this sozo is? Oh. I thought, oh, well, that's my question. <laughs> I keep reading it, and I'm like, what's this? Yeah, it's, it's, that's probably why we keep it in the bulletin. So, I don't know if you want to give an explanation, Pastor Kim. Um, basically, Sozo is in a prayer encounter with the Lord, where you um, have a, well, usually I'm the one that does this ministry, but other people do it too. Uh, there's a couple other people in the church who would meet. You know, it's usually with one or two people. It's one person is usually taking notes as to what God shows the person who's having the sozo. And the person who's helping you have the sozo is basically directing you through like a, a prayer encounter with the Lord. And um, so it seems to be that God shows up in special ways when you dedicate some time to pray together with other another believer and for God to open up some areas of maybe of woundedness in the past or something like that, that God has, a, a, there's a, a special anointing for God to show you his perspective on what happened during that situation, you know, where he was in, in that. Because some people have been abused or something and said, have said, why wasn't, why didn't God rescue me from that? Or why didn't God shield me from this happening to me? And in the Sozo, the person can see that Jesus was right there and was protecting them, or what, whatever God was saying about it, is he's um, giving, shedding more light on how he saw that situation, where he was during that situation. For example, I'll give you an example that might be able to illustrate. So a friend of ours, Pastor uh, Bob Muncy, Robert Muncy, who was actually here to preach not too long ago, um, his teenage daughter passed away in a car accident and he just had a very hard time grieving through that I mean losing a child is one of the most horrible, horrible things that we all can face in our lives you know and um, he decided he needed some kind of help from God special help from God to grieve that in a healthy way so he had a sozo encounter with some other prayer people in his church and during that time he literally had a vision of the accident and it was like he says like a movie screen it's like he stepped into a movie literally had a vision of the accident and Jesus reaching in and taking his daughter out and the angels and Jesus took her out of the accident and she looked back at the accident and said wow that's messed up and she went on and be with the Lord you know and they oh, wow. took off together and him seeing that that you know it was not really her she was off with God and, and him seeing that and having that such an anointed encounter with the Holy Spirit showing him the supernatural side of what happened was what really brought closure and healing to him to grieve his daughter. So, and he writes, a, he wrote a book about it. Right. It's called Where the Roses Bloom or something like that. It's a really good book and very, uh, so a sozo can be a, a special moment with the Lord where the Lord actually opens your eyes to see, uh, like for example, there's a um, passage in the Old Testament where the prophet is with a young servant and they're hiding out and the armies are, are against him. And the prophet says, open his eyes, Lord, so he can see. And he suddenly sees the armies of heaven, the angel armies around him, surrounding him, and realizes, oh, there's more with us from heaven. And that was a sozo moment that, that that young servant had. His eyes were open and he could see in the spiritual realm what was going on. So... That's basically what a sozo is. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's what I said to the couple that was there. It's, it's a dedicated prayer time. And this sozo leader is really just somebody who's praying with you 
and, and may help kind of guide you through the process a bit, maybe have some questions that'll help direct where things go. So that's, in this reading this week, that's kind of how I saw Simon, is that he believed and was baptized. He had some real mess. I mean, I, I believe that Peter's diagnosis is on the mark. He's, he's got wickedness in his heart. Um, he's trying to buy God. Does that mean he wasn't really a Christian? I've known Christians that were worse off than Simon. Sure. Who, who really loved the Lord. And again, his response to Simon that he doesn't argue, he doesn't try to play the card of, you don't know who I am, I'm the great one here in this community, mm -hmm. that he's humbled and receives from, from Peter, mm -hmm. really speaks to me that he wants to get better. Mm -hmm. So he's messed up, but um, he wants to get better. And again, I know a lot of folks in church, I've known a lot of folks in church through the years, that you can look right at them and, and you know, <laughs> I remember it's a different story. Um, in my campus ministry years, and, and I um, took a young guy that I was kind of discipling and mentoring uh, to a meeting, and the guy who was the leader of the meeting pulled me aside and said, this guy that you brought, he's got lust in his life. And I thought, yeah, he's, he's, he's a healthy college student. He likes girls. <laughs> maybe a little too much. Maybe he needs to get some reins on it, but, you know. I didn't think it really took a rocket scientist to figure that out, you know, <laughs> the way it's kind of oogling the girls a little bit. And it's like, yeah, you know, that'd be great. I'm, I'm trusting he's going to grow into greater holiness and, you know, bring all that under under wraps a bit. But, you know, yeah. So a lot of times we see stuff in Christians. And again, you know, the gift of discernment isn't the gift of criticism. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's meant Good to be point. that you can discern things and... Prophecy is meant to comfort, encourage, as well as um, you know, bring some challenge potentially. So that's how I saw Simon in this reading today. Was, no, that's a great perspective. I went yeah, back and it said yeah. he believed and was baptized, and his response after Peter rebukes him is, "Please pray for me." It doesn't mean he didn't have this stuff in his life. Honestly, if he was long term in sorcery, he was going to need several spiritual baths yeah. to get washed up and cleaned up come out the other side. Now, why did the early church identify heresy with Simon? I don't know. Maybe he didn't really repent after that. It doesn't record that he really did. Yeah. But, you know, again, there's there's lots of stories that we don't really get the ending to when it's there. So, um, I don't know. That's how I see it. And I want to have that be encouragement, again, for those who are you know with us on Absolutely. Facebook or catching it later. You know, if you believe and you still got some spiritual mess in your life, Let's look for people to pray for me. I mean, pretty much that's what Simon is saying is, Peter, can I have a Sozo appointment? When can we schedule this? <laughs> yeah. I need you to help me yeah. get this mess out of my life. I actually remember being on the mission field and having um, <laughs> people attach themselves to the team of missionaries that were doing the ministry. You know, I remember people like Simon yeah. showing up and um, because they lived in a culture that was doing fraudulent things and, and robbing each other and they lived in that culture that's part of the culture they are what what they grew up doing they would um ask they when one guy told all the missionaries all the young college student americans um to give him their money and he would exchange it into uh filipino uh, pesos for for him, for them well he took the money and ran you know and i I mean, that's literally happened, and I had a misgiving about doing it, and I didn't give them any money. Everybody else did, and I said, I'm not sure you should be doing that. And, um, and everybody gave him money, and he, he took the money in, but he got saved. He was one of the kids that got saved on right. campus. You can, know, you so, still be, can you be a Christian and steal? There you go. So, I, I mean, that's potentially, this, this guy reminds me of that, of that right. situation, really. So, so, again, just one perspective. In... I would encourage anybody when you read something like this, pray and ask the Lord, what do you want to say to me through it? And, and I, I really felt like that as I read. I thought, Lord, what's your take on Simon? And he said, well, it's, you know, my word says he believed and was baptized. My word says that he said to Peter, you know, pray for me. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't arguing. He wasn't playing the I'm, I'm really somebody in this community card. Um, you know, yeah, of course he had some baggage, don't we all? Definitely had some baggage, <laughs> So, oh, I want to read one thing real quick. Um, as always, it things, oh, this will be quick. And then, you know, <laughs> from Jack Hayford Study Bible, 
Peter and John's concern for the Samaritan revival directly relates to their desire that those born of the Holy Spirit also receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The texts in their ministry clearly differentiate between water baptism from receiving the Holy Spirit's fullness. The apostles laid hands on the converts and they received the Holy Spirit with miracle signs. For the apostles, the Holy Spirit fullness was no small matter. Their focus and approach were dedicated toward guaranteeing the transmission of the power of Pentecost among new believers. They obviously felt the need for every believer to become equipped with power, as sure as each of them had received new life in Christ and obeyed him in water baptism. And that's what Jesus says. Again, if we hearken back to Acts 1, he says, Power will come on you, and you'll be my witnesses. And, and God wants us to live that way. Christianity was not meant to be just a philosophy or a, a moral set of moral practices. It was meant to be a relationship with God Almighty and, and to have his power in our lives. And yes, we absolutely need to use it for good. We need to grow character. Um, we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit as much as we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, but we're meant to live with power. And in our time as a church, we had a couple of voices, two, three voices, um, Mike Albert has said this kind of stuff from time to time, but Bill Winberg, who actually this library is dedicated to, and Peggy Fisher are kind of those old school charismatics saying, where's the power? Where's the healing? You know, are we praying for people and really seeing their lives transformed? And I always take those questions seriously. Sure. You know, are we really seeing transformation in people's lives? And we certainly have over the decades as a church, but we want to see the real. The thing that I, I'm um, opposed to would be an accurate term is I'm not interested in theatrics for theatrics sake. I've been around the Pentecostal charismatic movement long enough to see you know people seeing something real and deciding they will copy it or work it up or you know jump on the train mm -hmm. and you know let's save the drama for reading the Bible here at Bible study. <laughs> um, so we want to see the real um, and even with that you know God's not put off. You know, God, God's bigger than people just trying to figure out spiritual stuff. You know, we don't have to be perfect in, in that journey any more than I think you see with Simon. So, we need to have the power. Read the red and pray for power, that's what they used Absolutely. to say. Amen. And, and I, I think that Peter and John going down to Samaria to pray for them was also a test for them. Mm -hmm. Because you, you read the text and it says they went down there and they... They said, oh, these guys are here, so they laid their hands on them. And I think for them it was, okay, God, if you're really supposed to be bringing us to people that aren't Jews, then right. there's going to be something happening here. And so the Holy Spirit fell on these people. And then you read the end of the chapter, the end of this block here, it says in 25, after testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem and they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. So let me ask you this. Didn't they pass those same villages coming down? Did they stop and preach the good news then? No. Right. I think that the Lord pouring out the Holy Spirit on the Samaritans who, who, who were not Jews opened up their eyes a bit. And I think they went, whoa. Whoa. Maybe this is... When, when God said go to the ends of the earth, maybe he meant other than just the Jews. Yeah. Maybe we should start doing that. So I, I really like the, even though these guys are, you know, the apostles, the, the, the pillars at this point of the entire church, mm -hmm. I love how teachable they are yeah. for, for, for God to be able to say, I'm going to open your eyes here. And then on the way back, they didn't just go back. Right. They stopped at all the towns on the way back and preached the good news on the way. Well, we'll see in, in two chapters, in chapter 10, I wonder if Peter, if we're interpreting a little bit, if Peter didn't go, well, the Samaritans are kind of Jews. Right? Could be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because when, Cornel yeah, when Cornelius, yeah. the Roman centurion, sends for Peter, Peter's like, no, Lord, not doing it. Yeah, not the Romans, the, the oppressors <laughs> right. of, of our entire society. That's a little too much. The Samaritans <laughs> are kind of my, you know, you know it's, it's it's brother almost, from another brother. mother. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like saying praying for Steelers fans or something. It's just, right. You just, it's hard to imagine. You know, <laughs> you need to pray for him. <laughs> the playoffs. I'm joking, of course. I'm an Eagles fan. Right, okay. Even though you live from the I just came area. from the Steelers country. So. Right. Isn't right. Jesus well. a Samaritan in some ways? 
because it's if your mother's Jewish, your father is not. And his mother was Jewish, and his father was not. No, his father was Jewish. Joseph was Jewish. No, God, Heavenly Father. Oh. <laughs> well, God's Jewish. <laughs> no, he's the first Catholic. That's my brother. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's funny. There's Patty thinking deep again. Sorry. <laughs> no, but you're, yeah, you're right. He, he, it might not open his eye all but at least, like I said, I like that they're teachable. That they go, oh, right. the Samaritans can receive the Holy Spirit. Then God, God mm -hmm. it must be okay to preach to them. Must be. Sure. So they didn't just go back; they preached on the way. Well, and I think again, in, in kind of a progressive spiritual <laughs> growth attitude, like I'm taking in my view of Simon tonight. Peter's getting it, but he doesn't have it quite yet. And after chapter 10, you know, he sees this vision three times, and then he goes and preaches, and here's a commercial for two weeks from now, <laughs> which Alan will be leading that week to. Um, Peter preaches so long that God gets tired of him preaching and just pours out the Holy Spirit on Cornelius and his household. Yeah. And Peter's like, well, I guess if God gave him the Holy Spirit, we can baptize him with water, <laughs> which also messes up the order of stuff. Yeah. You go, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't you have to get water baptized first? Nope. Not in Cornelius' house, you don't. Yeah, you, evidently, God, God can, can do it however pour out the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and again, I love how Jack Hayford has handled that, that Luke is not precise in his language. He's fluid. He uses different phrases to describe encounters with the Holy Spirit, that it isn't this exact thing. And, and it really sets us free to go, no, 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 it's not a formula. And I, I enjoy on a certain level listening to Bible teachers who have very little experience with the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit try to explain it. And it's like somebody telling you how to drive who's never been in a car. And you just go, you don't really have any idea what you're talking about. You're trying to explain this, I think, but you really don't. I think God's favorite thing about form, spiritual formulas is messing them up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which he's doing with these. That guys. makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, anyway, so I just I thought that was very interesting that they didn't preach on the way down, but they did preach on the way back. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Cool. Any other thoughts with Simon and Samaritans getting the Holy Spirit? Well, they had a heads up on believing after the woman at the well. Didn't she convert a lot of people yeah. ahead of the crucifixion and whatnot? Yeah, so there was already some seed sown in Samaria. Yeah. We don't know exactly which area was which compared to that, but God was already cracking the dam, so to speak. Yeah, that's a good point. There was already, you know, uh, Jesus kind of blasted well, things open there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think this is true for pretty much anybody, but the Samaritans were the outsiders. They were the half-breeds yeah, on the wrong side of the tracks. And, and the fame of Jesus was spreading through the region. Can we get in on this? And then he shows up and sits down at the well and has this conversation with this woman whose reputation is so bad she comes at the wrong time of day to get water. Um, and we've talked about her multiple times here at Harvest. Um, and and it, once again, it's Jesus crossing all those lines right. demographically to say, no, 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 you guys go get food. I got work to do. Um, the Jesus is for the outcast, the outsider, you know, the you know, wrong gender, the wrong race. Oh, she has a reputation. Mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't put off by any of that. And, and that's it, it needs to challenge us to be willing to cross those lines too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You like to see the humanity of people because a lot of choices that led to their unworthiness or undesirableness <clears throat> was just a result of the society they lived in. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really want to be a shepherd, but my father was a shepherd, and everybody else hates shepherds, and I guess I got to be a shepherd. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's just the, that's the way the cookie crumbled for them. Right. So it was nice that Jesus said, "I'm here for all y'all." Yeah. Not yeah. just the rich and famous and people that smell good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because shepherds probably didn't. Good. Good. All right. So we're doing good, right? What time are we? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good. And the battery's still working, so that's okay. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna uh, read twenty-six. Uh,
to the end. 40. Twenty-six to the end of the chapter. Yep. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, "Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza." Gaza. So he started out, and he met the tran treasure. treasure of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. And then. Eunuch. A eunuch of great authority under the Kanda. Kandake. Kandake. Oh, I lost. Okay. The queen of Ethiopia. 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 The eunuch. 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 The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and now he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading along from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from his prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb and sent before the, she the, the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The Enoch. Asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the Enoch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The Enoch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north to the town of... Azotus. What? Azotus. Azotus. There we go. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way till he came to Caesarea. Caesarea. <laughs> okay, so the Ethiopian unit. So there's a couple of cool things here in this passage. The first thing I want to say is that we, we were just talking about how the, the Jews kind of segregated themselves off and they, they were, um, they, you know, they had that, that there's a little bit of racial. Tribalism. Yeah. Uh, but that said, I still believe that even at that point in time, there that truth called to people's spirits. So, so here, here's the thing: God made us to be in communion with Him, right? That was one of the. That was, that's there's no. It's in our DNA. You can't get it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got these people all around the world who are trying to make up these gods, and they're trying to take these things that they're made, and they're trying to somehow fit it in the God hole that we have in our spirit, and trying to make it fill that hole and they're doing all these things trying to fill it up and trying to make themselves feel complete feel complete yeah exactly now imagine that you're living in Egypt right next to Israel and you hear about and so they've got of course Egypt's pretty ancient Egypt's pretty popular in, in you know our movies and stuff like that so everybody knows they had all kinds of gods some gods this god that god all kinds of stuff everything that happened they had a god and all the pharaohs were gods yeah, all the pharaohs themselves were God, all that stuff. So, you know, I believe that everybody's spirit has, you can feel that there's untruth in, in that. that. You can deceive yourself, but I believe that what happens is they hear about there's one God in Israel. And when they start to hear about that, I believe that their spirits resonate with the truth. And there's some people who are not mired enough in the world that they respond to it, that they recognize it, they go, wow, there's there's something there. I might not understand it all, 
but this is way better than any of this other stuff I've heard. And so at that time, you had different people that were not Jews that practiced Judaism, right? Okay, that had converted over. Now, the Jews, I don't think they, they I think they just kind of put up with them, if you would, okay? Um, they, try, you know, you've got scripture that says you're supposed to treat the outsider in certain ways and you're supposed to be nice to them and stuff, okay? But I don't think they ever really right embraced them into the family, if you would. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, that's what we have here. Is we have this this eunuch? Now this guy, um, there's different translations that say he might not have had the uh, medical, you know, eunuch. It might be uh, there's another term that it could have been that meant basically he was the treasurer for the queen, right, uh, of, of Egypt. So he's or Ethiopia. So he's a he's a pretty high up dude. And this guy had heard about God. And I believe it resonated with the spirit, and he said, "You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. That's, that's, that's got a lot. Feels like it's got a lot more substance. There's a lot more truth there than all these other things that are running around here. And because he's wealthy, okay, so he's not. I don't know. I just, I get the when I hear a eunuch in my head, I get the picture of this dude that's trapped in the castle. And he can't do anything. He just does these little things. This guy was an affluent person. Okay, he was somebody. He had a carriage. There weren't very many people who had carriages. Okay." And so he was able to go to Jerusalem from time to time to worship. Yes. He had enough money to buy scripture. Okay. Yeah. Now, again, you know how I am with history and stuff. I'm talking about traveling and stuff like that. So he's got carry, he's got horses. He probably had a couple other people with it. You, know, you didn't travel alone. You didn't have that a kind of pilot on his carriage. So you know, somebody else had to be driving. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, and, you know, books and scriptures were expensive. Yeah. Because there weren't any printing presses. If you wanted a copy of somebody had to be paid who had the skill and the paper, along with all the resources yeah. Yeah. to copy it over. And you you know, it had to be the same, you know. There's the people who were good scribes and bad scribes. Bad scribes yeah. miss words here and there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so this guy was he, he had money and he had found God. God had drawn him somehow. Okay, and I believe there are a lot of other folks like that. The, the Jews, like I said, the Jews probably pretty much just kind of, okay, we'll treat you nice because you're we're supposed to, but they never really embrace them as part of the family kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? So you've got this guy here, and he's coming back from worshiping in Jerusalem, going back to work. Okay, done, done with the vacation, going back. All right, and then so here's another thing, another nugget I like. I, I I love it. So so the angel of the Lord says to him. Go south and use this room. That's it, guys. Yeah. That was the initial. That was the initial message. That's all he got. Yep. That was his assignment. He, at that he, time. he didn't get told he was going to go meet somebody important. He right. didn't get told he was going to go do some ministry. He didn't get told he was there was going to be an orphanage of kids waiting for him. He didn't. No, uh, there's nothing. He was said, go on this road. This is the road that goes down to Gaza. And, and get moving south. That was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Philip had enough faith to step out and do that. Again, in a day and age where you only had enough supplies that you could carry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So so he gets going down. Then what's the next message that God gives him? Join this chariot. Yeah. Jump up and go over and walk alongside the carriage. God did not say go talk to the Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. Right. God walk didn't say Go preach the message to him. Go beat him over the head with the Bible until he submits. Okay? That's, I'm joking, but I, you know what I'm saying? Sure. God said go walk next to the carriage. That's all God told him. Mm -hmm. He goes walking by the carriage and he hears Isaiah. Mm -hmm. He hears the Ethiopian reading the scripture. And now you start to see the partnership that God intended for us to have with him. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because now Philip on his own says, that's the door God has for me. Mm -hmm. That's what all this message was leading toward. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what you're reading? Because he's reading about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I got it. I got you, but Okay. So then the Ethiopian's like, cool, yeah, dude, come on up in here. Now now, now I want to talk about some of the practical stuff that God can keep track of for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is not the age of vehicles. 
in cars. Philip was walking. Consider how much water you can carry when you're walking and how much food you can carry when you're walking, which is usually not a major obstacle because of how long, what's the distance that you can walk. Right. Okay. So he's walked for, we don't know how long, but it probably wasn't that long. Okay. He gets up next to the carriage, the Ethiopian says, come up in here and help me out. So Philip jumps up into the carriage. I know you guys know this, but I need you to bring it up from the subconscious to the conscious. The carriage is moving a lot faster and a lot further distance than you can walk. Okay? So at the end of all this, they come up to a body of water. We don't know how long they've traveled, but I can tell you it was probably much further than Philip had any food or water to get back for. So what does God do? Snatch you back. Take care of Here's the next mission. Yeah. Okay. That must have blown a smile off. I wonder. <laughs> what? Where am I? What day is it? That's that's one of those home movies in heaven that we we'll all go. Oh, it's Acts eight. Philip's going to talk about you know what it was like getting transported. Maybe yeah. he's going to beat me up. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, this was long before Star Trek. So. Right. So then this Ethiopian that you got, somebody who's very influential, very fluent, written, has money, gets saved, begins to understand the scripture, understand Jesus, gets baptized, and now goes back where? To, to the queen's palace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where and I met, I ended my sermon last night with that concept of faith legacy. What was now Philip's faith legacy right here, just before we even get further on when it comes up. Yeah. How many people in Ethiopia got saved? Yeah. Because when God said, take the road south to Gaza, Philip didn't say, what? Is that really you, God? Can we wait until after my show is done? <laughs> I, I, this TV, this, I've been waiting Preach for this it. episode. Preach it. I just need to binge it one more time and be fine, and then I'll go on the road. Mm -hmm. Of course, he would have missed the carriage by then, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Preach it. Okay. He was obedient immediately. Again, and I'm preaching to myself, because I do it too. When you hear the Lord, and he says, move, mm -hmm. get moving. Yeah. Okay. God doesn't have to tell you the whole details. Mm -hmm. If you step out in faith in the partnership that he originally planned for how we were supposed to live, he will do his side of the job. He will not, he will not leave you hanging. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave Philip hanging. Okay. Mm -hmm. He will not leave you hanging. If he says, step out on the road, go step out on the road. I've heard testimonies from people who said, God said to go buy a gallon of milk, you know, and they went and bought a gallon of milk, and then they said, after I had a gallon of milk, I didn't know what to do, and then I felt like God said, drive down this road and go to this house. I went to this house, and when I knocked on the door, the people were crying when I gave them the milk because they were out of money, and they were out of milk for their baby, and they didn't know what they were going to do, and they've been praying to God for the last day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same kind of patterns what Philip did too. Yes. Yeah. But if you never step out, if you never get moving when God calls you to move, then you, you don't get to see the miracles. You don't get you're not in place to, to participate mm -hmm. and to partner with God in the miracles that He wants to do. That's one of, I think probably one of the main reasons why some of us don't see as many miracles in our lives as we want to see is because we're not willing to step out when He calls us to step out. Mm -hmm. But we're looking for grandiose major miracles yeah. and miss mm -hmm. the small ones right. that we get. Absolutely. Oh yes, yeah. that too. Mm -hmm. And many times God is a good trainer. If you're not faithful in little, you won't be faithful in much. And there are times where I've done a little thing um, like this. I mean, it's one guy. Yeah. Right? Peter's not preaching some African revival and, and the field is full of hundreds of thousands of people. It's one guy. And I've, I've had ministry moments where God was so strong, and it was one person. And, and quite often the sense, you know, leaving the situation was God going, I'm so thankful that you would minister to my child. That's why I had to be so strong with you, because this was important. They're important to me, you know, and to make it happen. And, and sometimes it's, it's as simple as that, you know. Do the little thing, 
and maybe it'll open the door. They were desperate and been praying and talk to me, God, tell me, show me, teach me something. Right. You know, fill this gap in my life, and then there you sit with all the information and answers that they've been craving. Right. You know, one but gallon they, of milk. Yeah. <laughs> this is also the other side of the coin. Look at this. Is also shows God's heart for all of us, not just the Jews. Right. That this this Ethiopian was worshiping God. He was seeking God diligently. He spent his money to go to Jerusalem. He spent his money to get the scripture. He spent his time and his heart. It says he was worshiping. He had come, gone to, to Jerusalem to worship God. So this is also God honoring what he was working towards. He was reaching out to God. Mm-hmm. So God said, I'm going to send somebody to connect you with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and Alan preached this Sunday here at Harvest, and I've, I've been chewing on it. I've, I said to him you know, a couple of times, I think that message is something that God is saying to us as a church in this season. And I think God is saying it to the church. Shake off the paralysis that the pandemic tried to put on us and get out and get busy. (coughs) And let's start doing good. Let's start responding to the whispers of the Holy Spirit. Let's start, you know, making a difference. And even if it feels like things are different, and I've said it this way, it's like the, the rules have changed. It's like some of the way things work don't work the same. Some things do, some things don't. I'm going to talk about that this Sunday, why there seems to be some contradictions and how things function at this point in time. Some of that's just spiritual atmosphere. But the issue is, do we obey? Do we move forward? Do we do what Philip did? And that's when God responds to some things. And, and that's absolutely true for me personally, I've been trying to sift out, and you know, if you look at the organizational chart, humanly speaking, the buck stops with me, and that's a seat I have not liked sitting in for the last three years of going, how do we go forward, Tom? I have no idea. I have never been here before, and and, and Alan really, you know, um, spoke to this, that we've got to stay connected to God for those marching orders, because Sometimes it's left, sometimes it's right, which is at this time we've got to stay tuned in. So we've got to move forward with that ear, you know, cocked to heaven, um, just like we see with Philip. So I I think it's a fantastic um, confirmation of of that word to us, that we need to be willing to move. And if God says, take this road and go south, that was all the information he seemed to have. Well, and, and the other part of that is we a lot of times we all try to bargain with God to get the full plan. Like we want to know what's, what's the whole what's the whole deal? What's the whole deal? And if you really think about it logically from God's point of view, me telling you to walk by the carriage if you're not going to get on the road doesn't make any. There's no. It does right. It's, it's useless at that point. You don't need to know that part of the plan yet because you're not there. You won't understand it until you get there. Yeah. You know. I, I want to interject something. Oh, sorry. Right. That's okay. Um, so, um, how many of you remember the Queen of Sheba in, who came to Solomon? Mm-hmm. Um, history lessons show that the Queen of Sheba was from Ethiopia, was uh, probably from the kingdom of Aksum in Ethiopia, um, or the kingdom of Saba in Yemen, or both. She was a, a dignitary from that area. And so here is, you know, a lineage of the queens mm-hmm. of this land from the time of Solomon. And now it's connecting the dots to hear the, the gospel. And here, why is this guy, this dignitary from that land, seeking the God of Israel? Oh, yeah, that's, because I, that, I love that history stuff. Because that, that might have been, you know, the, the, the concept of God and, and somebody come back with Shiva. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So you're looking at, you talk about a faith legacy, you're talking about it coming all the way back down from Solomon's time. Yeah, Yeah. she was witnessed to by the, the, you know, beauty of the kingdom, and, you know, probably God revealed himself to her in some way, and she went back home and took that legacy with her, and here's this dignitary coming. Um, How cool is that? And Jesus even says, you know, one day the queen of Sheba will rise up in judgment against this generation who had me visit and didn't know me and did and rejected me and the queen of sheba who came to solomon you know from a distant land i mean jesus uses her in that that's right in that um passage in matthew and also in luke i believe and um how cool is that that there's that 
connection like you were making with Daniel. That same type of connection. God's been witnessing to that nation throughout ge- you know, yeah. history and the generations, and now it's all coming together with this one moment with the Ethiopian uh, 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 Just another point of how God's heart is for everybody. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that's cool. And Philip didn't get to stick around and see the results of his labors either. Well, that, that's my <laughs> other thought is that it, I, I've said this oftentimes, and this is really my pastor's heart, you don't give birth to a baby and then leave them on the side of the road and go, I hope you do well, see ya. And so I'm, I'm real big on if you share your faith with somebody and, and they have an experience with Jesus, you need to get them in a family. You need to you know, get them in a local church. You need to get them with people who can teach them the Bible and care for them, pray for them. Um, you know, just leave them there. So I read this and I go, wow, one Bible study and, and God pulls Philip out? Now, obviously, the guy was worshiping. He knew the scripture, you know, so there was some other background there. But sometimes pastors and evangelists have a little trouble <laughs> with each other. Evangelists are like, no, I'll just give out tracts to the toll booth director. And I'm like, well, what happens if they come to faith? You know, then God's going to get them a pastor and somebody who will care. I was about to say, that's, this is one of those, you know, it doesn't say it, but. Knowing God's heart, I'm sure if he had somebody connected with that oh, guy yeah. back in Ethiopia. Right. And, and, and Philip, he was like, that's all you had to do. Let's, yeah. let's get yeah. you out of here. And Next. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen that. And you really, basically, it's just you got to do your part. Mm-hmm. you you got to stay in your lane. you got to play the role that God has for yeah. you. And, um, you know, I, that's part of why more and more for me, ministry-wise, Seaford is my mission field. Because if I reach somebody here, either I can say, come to church with me, or, no, I know a church that would be a good fit for you. I know the pastor. I can help plug you in. Um, I've, I've done mission work, and it's a little tough for me. Um, you know, I, I think about you guys being in Belize and the orphanage and stuff, and it's awfully hard to leave when you go, oh, oh yeah, the there's work that can be done here. Mm-hmm. Um, but evangelists are like, I've done, you know, I kind of, poured out what I got, I'm on to the next place. And God uses both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. I think we're on time. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's the end of that chapter. So, uh, uh, Kim, do you want to pray for us? Okay. Lord, we thank you for just revealing your heart to us tonight, um, that you have been and you are continuing to reveal yourself to the nations, uh, whether they're nations that are um, in uh, different beliefs of different things that are uh, deception or whatever it is, you're finding your remnant in every nation. So we thank you, Lord, that um, the, the good news is not just for one group of people, it's for everyone in the whole world. And so God, we thank you for the witness that you've had to the world. We thank you, Lord, that your heart is inclusive And we trust you, Lord, that you're going to use us to continue that work. Help us to be obedient instantly when the Holy Spirit says to go and to speak to someone or or to pray for someone or whatever it is. Lord, I I pray that you'd give us just a a shot in the arm of uh, zeal for the kingdom and energy to do the gospel and obedience to listen to you and, and, and instantly obey. We thank you, Lord, for helping us to be better witnesses. Would you baptize us afresh in the Holy Spirit so that we can be better witnesses as we go? In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Next week, I highly recommend you check in with us. We're going to see Saul become Paul. Radical conversion story. Acts chapter 9. Good stuff.